and to get engaged uh, at any point in the tasting allows me to learn from you, but also for you to teach the people we're all tasting with. So that's why I'm really excited about this format. Um, speaking about uh, getting engaged, like I said, you can ask questions, you can make comments, but what we're going to be also doing is things called wine IQs or wine interactive questions. And these wine interactive questions are meant to get you in, in engaged. So we're gonna, I'm gonna show you what I mean by a wine IQ. Okay, I'll pull up the first one. This is the first wine IQ. And this is a gimme. I just told you where the wine was from. So this is an easy one, but I figured we're gonna um, try and avoid any uh, tipsy typing at the beginning and um, you know, give you an easy one and, um, and, then, and then we'll get a little tougher later. So where is this wine from? Okay, and while you're doing that, um, I just want to uh, say a couple things. If you're looking over to, I guess it would be your right, and looking at the chat stream and thinking there's no way I'm participating in this or I have no idea where to even start, don't worry. Um, that uh, is actually really easy to get involved and um, by the end of this tasting tonight, I'm going to show you where you can find out how to get involved with tastings uh, in the future. Okay, so where you can really chat in. Also, I want to introduce Skip Forrest. He's in the room. So, Skip, can you say hi? Hi, everybody. <laughs> I don't know if you heard him, but Skip's here, and he's going to be monitoring the, the chat roll tonight so that um, I can focus on you and talking to you, and um, Skip is going to tell us what's going on on the chat roll. So, Skip, what's going on over there? <laughs> uh, not, not much, right? Yet, Cr no. Crickets? <laughs> Just listen. Okay. Well, in, in the chat, I see a couple people coming in with B, which is good. So people are actually here and listening. This is fantastic. Okay. So um, getting back to the wine, um, this wine really sticks out in my head, uh, not only for the story, but because it's a wine that often can, um, tricks people into thinking that it's a French champagne. I mean, the label looks very French. It ha like I said, it has uh, French writing and, and French language on it. Um, and it even tastes French. And I'm going to talk about Cricket Cricket. I see uh, someone <laughs> on the chat roll just says Cricket Cricket. At least there's crickets, right? Um, so uh, there's... Um, yeah, see, I, see, I've got to get good at this, watching the chat stream and letting Skip do it and talking at the same time. But this wine, uh, like I said, fools some people because it not only looks on the exterior like it's French champagne, but it actually tastes like it too. But it's not. And what's really interesting about it is that it comes in at a fraction of the price of champagne. It's usually about half of what you'd pay for champagne. Champagne usually bottoms out around $35 and this is we have it in the 12 to 16 dollar range so really about half of what you might expect from a champagne so what's all this talk about champagne it's like what champagne what are you talking about all wine with bubbles is champagne right not so much um, there are a couple things that make champagne something very unique and something that is uh, is singular to a certain region and a certain process. And there are certain things that make it this way, and, and I've alluded to them already, but the first thing is it's in a unique location. So um, Champagne uh, it has to come from a very small region within France. It's actually only about 135 miles squared, square miles, that are able to produce grapes for Champagne. That's it. No one else can produce grapes for Champagne. So it's a very unique location, not only in terms of its size, but also how it's come together over millions of years has created climate and soil and temperature and weather and precipitation and slope and aspect and all these unique things that contribute to making a wine that cannot be recreated anywhere else. And I know you think I'm crazy that you're saying there, whatever, you know, it's just grapes. But really, when you get it down to the nitty gritty, it took millions of years to create a bedrock and then a subsoil and a soil that come together with just the right, uh, not right even, but just the unique composition that you find in Champagne. And that's just one example. So that is one thing that makes uh, Champagne so unique. Second thing is it takes a lot of work to make Champagne. And that's not just because the winemakers want to, you know, they're not uh, uh, um, want to be a slave to their, their product. It's because the law says if you want to call your wine Champagne, it has to come from this one small region and you have to follow our rules. You have to do lots of rules, in fact, because we want to guarantee a certain style of wine 
and a certain quality of wine. So that also comes into play when you're dealing with champagne. And then finally, like I said, uh, it's a small region, so it's fairly small production. And what that means is that the whole world is relying on this one little place for all of their champagne demands. And if you, you ever did the basic economics class, you've got high demand and limited supply and the price is gonna go up. So this is where I, we see champagne being at uh, a lot higher prices because the land is expensive for producing these grapes. And um, as a result, you're gonna have high prices. So champagne technically can only come from this one region in France. And in fact, it's not just like the winemaker saying this, it's mandated by law. So if you were to put champagne on your bottle in America, it's illegal. If you were to do it in France as well, it's illegal. You cannot put champagne on your bottle unless it's in from this region. Has, oh, other side. Lots of work and, and then there's small production there. So what do these three things have in common with Gruet? I mentioned this has a style that's very similar to champagne and yet it comes in at half the price. So here comes wine IQ number two, and it's not an easy one. So I hope you've been um, paying attention and um, maybe sipping a little wine. So if you haven't been paying attention, you have some liquid courage right now. Um, but which of those three conditions that we just went over, so unique location, labor intensive process, or limited production is not true for Gruet. So go ahead and see um, what we, I got them. B, so lots of labor, so we're not putting a lot of labor into Gruet, perhaps. I saw one B, we'll see what else comes in. As you're, as you're starting to chat in A, okay, it's not in a unique location. Well, let's go with that one first, A. Let's uh, explore that idea. And by the way, I hope you're drinking along throughout this. Because <laughs> this really is not fun unless you're drinking wine. Or at least it's a lot more fun if you're drinking some wine, okay? So in fact, I'm gonna take a sip as well. Okay, so unique location. Well, let me tell you, Champagne, this isn't Champagne, Champagne is produced in a region that is at 49 degrees north latitude. It's like, what does that mean? Okay, in the world of wine, most all of our wine are found between the 30 and 50 degree north and south of the equator. 50 and, 30 and 50 degrees north latitude lines. Champagne is found at 49 degrees north latitude line. It's really far north. And there's a lot of other things that go into it, but we're gonna, we're gonna focus on that one detail. Um, Albuquerque, New Mexico, not so far north, right? That's at about uh, 35 degrees north latitude. So at the other end of the band, total other end of the band. So we would think perhaps that it's not unique location that Gruet has, but I'm gonna complicate things. Gruet is, the, the vineyards are planted at 4,200 feet elevation. I'm gonna put that into perspective. Take three Trump buildings, stack down one another, and then plant a vineyard up there. Okay, that's pretty unique, right? And what it's doing is it's taking what would otherwise be a very warm climate and making it cool like champagne. So both of these actually have uh, these unique location, uh, very unique for, for their surrounding area. Now B, I also saw some people saying B. I agree, Susan. It might not be from France, but it is unique. That's, it's very unique to have a wine from New Mexico and, and to be really excited about it. I mean, I, I hope no one's watching from New Mexico because I'm sure you have great wine. But um, it's just like, because it's so close to the equator relative to other winemaking regions, it's difficult to make wine in New Mexico. Okay, so, but lots of labor. Um, well, let me show you something. They actually tell you right on the label something. If you look, oh, let's turn this around up here you're gonna see something written in French. And it's Method Champenois. It really means champagne method. Okay, I don't even know French very well, but I can translate that for you. Champagne method. What they're telling you is that they're using the exact same process as those in Champagne. Now, the law does not mandate it, but they have chosen to do it. In fact, Gray is a, is a French Champagne family. They came from Champagne. They couldn't find land over in France, enough land to do what they wanted to do. So they came to New Mexico and planted the vineyards there. Now, um, Method Champenois, this is really interesting. I mentioned you can't put champagne on a bottle unless it comes from champagne and it follows that process. Well, the people from Champagne are so particular about people you know, taking, taking their name and using their name to profit off of that they've even in France protected that Method Champenois that is illegal to put on a bottle 
in France as well. So the Americans, we say, okay, we'll respect your champagne, but Method Champenois, now you're pushing it. So we're still going to use Method Champenois. So in France, actually, what you'd see on a bottle that's telling you, hey, we're doing the same thing the Champenois are doing, is Method Traditionnel or the traditional method. So those are some keywords you'd look for on a bottle if you're looking for a champagne-like wine, okay? And then, um, so, well, that leaves us with C. C is the correct answer. When we're, we're dealing uh, with land in New Mexico, it's not as expensive as uh, Champagne France, and uh, we've got a little bit more land to, deal, uh, to, to work with. So the answer here for wine IQ number two is C. So, um, but great, uh, uh, participation from everyone. I'm just, it's, I'm trying to keep everything on my screen and um, in order here. So now that we've established what makes Gruet so unique in, in that it's like champagne, it tastes a lot like champagne, but it comes in at half the price. Let's actually taste it together. I mean, like I said, I hope you're tasting this ahead of time, but let's actually taste it together. And um, while we're doing that, um, I'm actually gonna fl uh, flash up wine IQ number three um, because I want you to think about why we use flutes. Here's why I, I did two glasses. I'm not just a lush, okay. Um, or why don't we use just a white wine glass for our champagne? And while you're thinking about that and chatting that in or interacting with us, I'm gonna um, tell you a little bit about how we approach wine tasting. And we meaning me. <laughs> Who am I kidding? Okay. <laughs> so we keep it simple. That is the cardinal rule is keep it simple. And so um, you want to engage all of your senses and you want to um, uh, just keep it simple so that you don't get bogged down by details and you have fun and you enjoy it. So the first thing you want to engage is your sense of sight. So when you look at this wine, this is going to sound really simple, but I really mean it. Red, white, or rosé. Okay, so you can chat that in. You should all be chatting that in. There should be no hesitation about what color wine this is. I'll show you. Okay, so I want everyone chatting in. Okay, so um, I'm not gonna tell you what it is because you guys should all tell me. Thank you, white, white, good guys. <laughs> um, so this is a white wine. So we start simple. Okay, I'm gonna get more in depth in this in just a second. Let's visit wine IQ number three. Um, what did, um, Skip, did anyone chat in or uh, answer wine IQ three? Um, I didn't see an answer. No answers, uh, I got you. Uh, there are, I was just reading a different answer. Okay. There's, there's C and there's A. So C and A, those, those work. Let me go down the list here. Why we use flutes for sparkling wine. Um, is it, it's cool. Well, I may have got tricked you on this one, but a is correct, that's one correct answer. And why? Well, if you look at these two glasses here, the champagne flute is more compact and it's smaller. And so what it's actually gonna do is preserve the temperature. Champagne should, or sparkling wine in this case, should be served at a very cool temperature. And so your champagne flute is for a very practical reason. It's gonna keep it cool. So it's cool, okay? Um, it's pretty. Now again, this is also correct. Um, if you look at these two glasses here, let's get them all in the... Uh, it might be hard to see through the fruit flies I have in here. <laughs> Blame the warm weather and sugar in the wine, okay? Um, but uh, you can see on this one, let's see how close I can get. There's bubbles, but they're not as pretty. They're not as uh, well-formed. They're not as consistent. Whereas this one, there's longer beads. It's beautiful. They were poured at the same time. So the reason is that it's, it's an aesthetic reason. Your sparkling wine is going to look prettier in here. So it's cooler and it's prettier. Smells better? Not so much. Um, this one, this glass, a white wine glass, is actually built better for smelling than this. Now, I mean, try to get your nose in this one. You're, you're really going to struggle on that. Um, but if you get your nose in this one, you can really get your nose in it, and it's a larger base and a concave top. That's ideal for smelling wine, okay? Whereas this one, it's not going to work as well. So let's see, um, let's talk about what we're smelling. You guys tell me, what are you smelling on this wine? I would love to, um, so, oh, okay. So, so Brian mentioned uh, that bubbles are traveling through more liquid and releasing more flavor and aroma. Right, so when you have um, a glass like this, you actually don't need a glass like this quite as much 
because you actually have carbonation and carbonation is going to allow the aromas to travel to your nose um, a little quicker and a little better. Um, and so, in fact, um, we often swirl, say, our white wine. And that's to aerate and allow the aromas to come to the nose. Whereas this, you're gonna struggle to swirl it. It's just not made to be swirled. But also, what's going on here is that you don't need to because the carbonation is actually releasing the aromas that much better to your nose anyways. Also, you don't wanna swirl these because if you swirl them, then you're going to release a lot of the carbon dioxide that you just paid a lot of money to put into the wine, okay? Um, so I, someone's uh, BG Dub, thanks, you said bread yeast, lemon zest, perfect, that's great. I would say when you're smelling these, um, again, we want to start simple. So we talked about the, um, the uh, on site to start simple. For this one, you for smelling, you also want to uh, keep it simple. So I would start with fruit, earth, and spice. So um, that way, it's not uh, it's not intimidating to smell the wine, and um, but then you can get as specific as BG Dub did and said bread yeast and lemon zest. That's perfect. That's you know what I would do is I'd say okay, I smell fruit. I get a good amount of fruit on this wine, and then I'd say well what kind of fruit? And definitely uh, citrus. And I might say oh and also some tree fruit, some apples and and pears and poached apples. And then I might go down the list and say, do I get spice? Hmm, yep, I do. I get uh, some, well, some bread yeast might qualify as spice, but I also get some toasty aromas. And then something else I get on this wine is um, some earthy notes that are, I would uh, classify as floral. I get a lot of floral notes on this, especially white flowers, not yellow or purple flowers, and then specifically a white flower in acacia. So, um, you can stop at earth, you can stop at floral, or you can go all the way to white flowers and acacia if you want. Um, Skip, do you have something to say? Uh, Susan said, tells us that she wouldn't normally think of this, but she smells uh, dairy. So, butter. okay, so someone smells, Susan uh, smells dairy or butter, definitely. Um, without a doubt, uh, good, good comment, Susan. Anyone else, Skip? Uh, I've got some questions. We'll come back to it then. Let's come back to the questions at the end. I just want to make sure I don't go too over. I think I'm already about at 20 minutes. So we're trying to do 20 minutes. I um, don't think that's going to happen tonight, but we're going to do the best we can, okay? Um, so that is some of the things that you might tap into for um, this particular wine, is uh, some of those aromas. You all had some great ideas. And um, I actually want to talk about what, how you can actually smell all those things we were talking about earlier. So uh, unique location, lots of work, and maybe a small production. You can actually taste those things in your wine. So I'm gonna do this pretty quickly so that I don't take up too much of your time. But when I mentioned acacia and also yeast, um, BG Dub, you mentioned um, yeasty bread-like aromas. That takes, science says it takes about mm, 18 months or so to create that. And uh, what I mean by that is it takes 18 months of this wine in storage or, or um, in aging to get to that aroma. The, that aroma does not come from the grapes. It does not come from fermentation, but it comes from aging the wine. This particular wine, the Gruyere, is actually aged for two years. So that, the, the, the aromas of acacia, it actually is an um, interesting uh, indication that this has been aged for a long time and bread and yeast are all aromas that are coming from it being aged for two years. Now what I want to ask you, I challenge you, find me a wine that's aged for two years or more and costs less than 20 bucks. That is hard to do. So this Gruyere is really um, uh, an outlier in terms of the quality and the, the amount of work that goes into it uh, when compared to its price tag. Okay, then another thing that you can find in this wine is let's go ahead and taste the wine together. So we've been smelling the wine. Go ahead and take a couple sips. And what you might get on this wine is that citrus that BG Dub mentioned. Lots of citrus notes. And um, also maybe some of that earthiness. It, it tastes um, almost earthy and um, citrus. Um, I get a lot of uh, that zest, that citrus zest. And what that is, is those are characteristics that come from a cool climate. So what we're seeing is that this is planted at 4,200 feet in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Now, we can't extract that just from saying citrus, zest, and, and minerality, 
But those particular aromas are very characteristic of cool climates. So we're actually able to taste a bit of the location in this wine. So the only thing that's not up here is limited production. We can't taste it, but we can see it on the price tag. There isn't a limited production, as, or I should say as limited of a production for Gruet as there is in Champagne. And as a result, we get a lot lower price, half, half the price sometimes of a, a, a entry-level Champagne. So that's the one uh, uh, characteristic we, that we don't see over here that would uh, say that this is just like Champagne. But the style and the, the, the process and the location is all very similar to Champagne. Now, the way I want to end these, I'm, I'm trying to stick with, stay within 20 minutes. I'm, I'm kind of staying within that. I think it's been about 25 minutes, but is to end it with, what do you think about the wine? So what do you think about the wine? Okay, I'd love to hear what you think. And this, this particular classification system or, um, that's not classification, or rating system, I should say, doesn't involve numbers or stars. And it, it does take into consideration your preference, but also quality as well. And I'll explain these while you're, um, while you're, you're chatting in what you think. Dump it means it's so bad you don't even want to finish the glass. It's going down the drain. Forget about it. Not even cooking wine. This thing is not any good. Finish it. Okay, this wine's good. I'll finish it, you know, but I don't know if I'll go out and buy another bottle. The next thing is buy it. So with all the wines in the world, you can try a different wine every day of your life and never go to the same one. And you're going to go back to the same one because you like it that much. So it's a pretty good wine if buy it. Stock it. This is like killer. This wine is just, you know, you want to have it around when your friends come over. You want to have it around for Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday night, whatever night it might be. This is a keeper. And then save it. It's reserved for those wines that are probably in the stock it likability, if that's a word. But they're maybe more expensive or you see potential in it and you think, okay, I'm going to hold on to this. In a year or two, I think it's going to be even better. So save it's like, okay, this is a special wine. I'm not going to buy five of these because that's like my paycheck, but I will, I will buy one and save it. So that's what I think. I'd love to see what you guys think. What do you, what do you think, Skip? I want to hear what you think, Skip. You're getting a lot of stock it. Stock it. All right. You, I, I read like a book, so I know what you guys, you guys know what I think already. I mean, I am, I'm really bad at telling you, um, to pretending. What do you think, Skip, though? Um, I ran out of wine really early. He, well, he ran out of wine really early, in case you can't hear him. And so I think he should put stock it. If you ran out of wine early, that means you're, you're enjoying stock it. it. Stock it. Okay. Any other, um, let's see, so we're getting lots of stock it. Yeah. Buy it. Anyway. Stock it. And the people tasting it with me think it's from France. Like it, Susan. <laughs> you can, yeah, you can trick your friends. Who cares? You know, tell them it's like a top end champagne. They won't, honestly, I'll bet you, you pull this out with um, some of your experienced champagne friends. Pull this one out with, like, say, a $35 champagne, and I'll bet you this one um, actually is more uh, preferable. Now, I'm not saying that this is identical to champagne, but it has a lot of things that you don't find in other sparkling wines in the world, um, but that you do find in champagne and it's coming at half the price, which is just, it's, it, that's fun to find values like that. So here's what I think. I think you all know what I think. Stock it, okay? So I, I love having this one in my fridge. It's, um, it shows complexity. We um, all talked about how much um, we, uh, sorry, I just got <laughs> distracted by a comment, but it, um, it, it's got complexity, it's got intensity, and the length is great. What I got distracted about is BG Dub. Good, good question. Where's the palette? Did I not, did I skip the palette? I think I did, right? I didn't even talk about the palette. Yep. See, this is what the first uh, wine cast is for. We just totally skip over the palette. Here, I'll do it real quick for you, okay? And then, um, and then we'll sign off. Um, but, and I don't have to do it, you can do it. You guys tell me, what are you tasting on the palette? I, I shouldn't be the only one tasting, that's no fun. Um, but what I do get is a dry wine. So what I mean by dry is that this wine is gonna have little to no sugar. Um, this one does have a little sugar in it though, because I see, I have fruit flies because I, they come out of nowhere, especially when it starts to get warm. And so there is some sugar in here, but it tastes dry. And why um, we also might get that message is the label tells us. Down here, when you see Brut, that means a dry style. Now, it tastes dry though, and that's because the acid is high. The acid on this wine is very high. Um, go ahead and take another sip, and I'll, I'll show you what I mean. It's a dry wine. But now, pay attention to what happens to your cheeks as you taste. 
you just keep salivating and that's a physiological response to acid so you really can't um, um, avoid it uh, it becomes more difficult with red wines which we'll get to uh, maybe next week but yeah so you get um, high acid on this um, and then body this actually has a medium body and I also skipped over another portion just to keep on stay on time was talking about the grapes this is actually made from 75% Pinot Noir yeah I know that it's a red grape you think I'm crazy but no this is 75% Pinot Noir they just remove the tinted skins ahead of time and um, as a result, you get a, a white wine, but this one has the body almost of a red sparkling wine, if that makes any sense at all. Um, and then what else? And then the finish. Um, I think this has a nice long finish with like these cheek sucking uh, citrus rind and a, um, it's got a great evolution. It starts kind of a, a, a prickly start um, with that citrus and, and then it, it mellows out to this um, toastiness, this warm toastiness, and then it comes in from a nice soft landing with that, like I said, mouth sucking, cheek biting um, uh, citrus rind, and then and then it has this nice just finish, just kind of lingers a little. So that's why I really like this wine. It's it's got evolution, it's got complexity, it's got intensity, um, and uh, it comes in at a great price. So Skip, I think you have a good question over there. What do you got for me? Lily Yo-Yo asks, are sparkling wines slash champagnes meant or known for their aromas? So are sparkling wines known for their aromas? That comes from Lily Yo-Yo? Right. Okay, great. Um, are they, yeah, definitely. You definitely want to tune into aromas. Um, what you'll find, why champagne from France is so valued and difficult to uh, replicate is that you get, on some of them, really intense noses meaning smells, and what that, um, and, and those smells are not things you can replicate through vineyards um, or through um, just fermentation, it's through the process of aging. So you get lots of, um, B, BG Dub mentioned them, like yeasty, bready, um, lots of mineral, and that comes more from the weather and climate where champagne is. Um, because it's so cold, those things can come through on the wine. So definitely, spar on sparkling wine, nose is just as important as everything else. Any other um, questions over there, Skip? Well, I've got one more. I don't, I don't know if you can do this. Quickly. Okay, I, I'm are, there, being... are there good and bad years for champagne? Like... Are there good and bad years for champagne? Heck yeah. Um, now, let me, let, me, let me say, for champagne, yes. Okay, this wine... You won't see a, a vintage on it. That's because most of your production in Champagne is non-vintage, as this one is too. This is not a Champagne, but most of your cha uh, Champagnes are non-vintage. When there is a um, good year, then the producers will declare a vintage. So um, they, they don't do them in every year, and they'll only do them when you've got some of the best grapes. And as I mentioned, it's at the 49 degree north latitude line. So it's what we call a very marginal climate. It's difficult to get good years every year and that's actually why they make champagne we're gonna have a whole another wine cast on sparkling wine because this this oh my god we could just go on and on forever about uh sparkling wine and that would be my dream come true i love sparkling wine um so yeah now this particular wine uh Gruyere, they do have vintages if you go on their website they do offer vintages but because they're so far south and so high altitude not only are they um have lots of sun but it's really dry up there. So they actually have very little vintage variation is what we call it. From year to year, you don't see a big difference in the weather. So as a result, they don't declare vintages as much as a, as a necessity, as much as a, more of a commercial thing, I think. Um, so, but definitely vintages in, or years in which the grapes are harvested does matter, so. All right, I want to thank everyone. I don't want to take up too much time. I think we've been on for about a, a half hour, about 35 minutes. And um, if this was not enough time, don't worry. We're going to do more and more every week. We're going to do these. Um, we're starting in October, just one a night. But then starting in November, what we want to do is three a night. And they'll all be about 20 to 30 minutes long. And there'll be different levels of tasting. So you can take all three of them and do an hour and a half, if that's what you're looking for. Or you can um, select that you want to be in the wine newbie one. And, and we'll have a different level information there versus the wine explorer or the wine guru. So we'll, we'll delve into the soils in the wine guru and we'll talk about maybe what vintage versus non-vintage is in the wine newbie, something along those lines. Um, and then one other thing is that I just want to uh, let you know next week we're going to be doing Malbec. Um, Desero is the, the producer. And the theme is actually going to be 
uh, crowd pleasers. This is one that I find um, most people who try this like this wine. And so I want to uh, tell you um, or, or, or explore with you rather what makes a wine a crowd pleaser. Why does it appeal to a large number of people? So we'll explore that concept next week. If you haven't gotten the wine for next week yet though, this website here, you can go there. It has all the information. So here is the website where you can find how to get the wine for next week or um, upcoming weeks. You can also find um, uh, how to chat. There's a tutorial on how to chat. So if you saw all these people chatting, like, how do I do this? Then, um, then go there. You'll see that. And then also, there's a survey. If you take the survey, I mean, if you got this far, even if you suffered through this, you may as well take the survey and tell me you suffered, okay? Because I just want, it'll make it all that much better. I'd rather know what you didn't like and what you liked, but don't be, you don't have to be polite. I, I can take criticism. So definitely tell me what you like and don't like, and I'm willing to bribe you for it. So I'm willing to send you a $80 gift card. Good, well, you can't use it yourself. You gotta give it to someone else, okay? It's a little little caveat there. But that is where you go to get that. So, my friends, I think we're signing off. Anything, um, Skip, I should mention on the chat roll? Uh, no. Okay, thanks everyone. I see everyone saying uh, thank you and uh, I appreciate your comments already. I really appreciate it. I appreciate you believing in this crazy concept. I think um, it's gonna, um, I think we can make it something special. Um, and uh, I, I hope you enjoyed Bubbles on a Budget. And next week we'll be doing Crowd Pleasers. And I'm Jessica Bell from My Wine School and this is Wine Your Way. Cheers. <laughs>